or the birth of one of your daughters. Which was the greatest moment in your life? <laughs> and by the way, if you pick your daughters, you have to pick which one. Uh, it's a tie between my daughters. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Come on. We know that this one of them was a bigger deal than the other. They might listen to this someday. and uh, no, They'll never listen to it. <laughs> Trust me. They won't listen to it unless it's like in the eulogy or something. Okay. So what was the fall of Berlin Wall like? Well, I wasn't actually. I was there on New Year's Eve, 1989, 1990. Yep. So that's when the wall was coming down. So you, I went. You, didn't you start the whole thing by saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall? Isn't that the story you've told me for all the – got to pay attention to the news. Yeah, but I mispronounced his name, so uh, <laughs> nobody, nobody paid attention. Um, uh, How did you, mis- you mispronounce it? I think I called him Horbachev. Uh, I thought in Russian the G would be silent. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. What was that like? Oh, it was incredible. I, as far as I know, I, I mean, I'm sure there were other Americans there, but I was the only American that I ran into. Yep, but I, but I had gone by there, and you were backpacking uh, across Europe at the time, right? And you had your your backpack with your Canadian flag on it. I did not have a Canadian flag. <laughs> I didn't have any flag, but it was common for it is common for yeah. Americans to put a Canadian flag on their bag. That's true. Yeah, I spent Christmas in Salzburg, and then uh, I said, "All right, where do I want to go for uh, New Year's Eve?" And I thought about it for a few minutes, and I'm like, "There's only one place to be," so I went to Berlin. But I went out to Hanover in Germany, which was it was West East Germany then, and then I had to hitchhike from Hanover to Berlin through East Germany. So that was a pretty cool experience. Yeah, it must have been. Uh, this is a serious question, but I'm <laughs> going to ask it in the most incendiary way possible, okay? We've established you have two daughters. I will say now one's in high school. She's a high school athlete. One was a high school athlete. She's in college now. As a coach, how much does it make your blood boil? How insane does it make you? How much do you identify with a character from Edgar Allan Poe? Watching your two girls play sports for other coaches. If the other coach knows what they're doing, it's fine. And, and when they don't? <laughs> they don't. It's, it, it's hard to bite your tongue, but I've been successful at doing it. You've been successful in at, at biting my tongue and not and what's it like, uh, what's, making what's a the scene. internal What's the internal day role temperature like watching your, your kids play sports when you disagree with the coach? Boiling blood is pretty, pretty accurate. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And, and I know you've been on the other side of it, too. Anything you want to talk about? Oh, about parents? Uh, about other people who might have a background in sports. I mean, I know parents, every every coach has that story about the parent, but there are some parents that are more qualified. So have right. you ever, ever had that, that situation where you've had a parent who's, let's say, qualified uh, in the world of sports who's um, disagreed with your coaching that you want to you want to share? Well, what... My experience has been that most who are qualified, who know what they're talking about, they're not the ones who bother you. Okay. It's the ones who aren't qualified. So, and, and to be honest, I haven't had a guy who's come up to me or a woman to give me a hard time about anything I'm doing that, that, that I believe are qualified, know what they're doing. So you just. So I, I really haven't had that. Uh, I'm sorry. I just, I, I know you want that experience, Bill, but I haven't had it. Bill, let me ask you, do you think he's condescending to those parents? That disagree with him? No, he, he seems um, pretty straightforward. <laughs> the, the, the best players will play. The most motivated players will play. And sometimes parents need to hear, what, hear the truth. Parents need to hear the truth? How many parents Absolutely. can accept the truth? I remember my boxing coach told my mother, she goes, why would you even bring your son to a boxing match? Because he sucks so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they didn't say that. I'm sure they said... We need somebody to box for the other boxers. They were going to call social <laughs> services on it because you thought it was child abuse by allowing me to go into the ring. <laughs> they probably thought uh, this will be a way to cure him of his ADD. We'll beat it out of him. So what? Do you want to follow that up, Mr. Kroll? <laughs> well, I do remember now. Back, I used to coach at Linfield High School <laughs> back before the prep a long time ago. And I coached a lot of uh, sons and daughters. I coached freshman basketball and softball of uh, a lot of Bruins and Celtics players. Yeah. So it was most of those guys were were great. Yeah. Um, there were a couple like to get a little too involved. They like to get a little too involved. They had a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and that's all you're going to say about um, that. Yeah. Fine. Again, Dell. I know the stories. I know the specifics. I, you know something? Was, if I was a coach and I had a hockey player parent who played for the Bruins, I wouldn't argue with the hockey player <laughs> parent or the you know. Some hockey player. This guy's well, tough. That's the difference between <laughs> you tough. and Coach Kroll, and that's why you're not in the Hall of Fame. Uh, you coach, you mentioned you coach in Linfield. Uh, you coach Linfield girls. That's how you started. 
you coach the Linfield boys. I think I think you turned. I think Linfield girls went from went became pretty competitive on your watch. I think Linfield boys became better on your watch. And then you took over a wagon at the prep, and you continued the success at the, at the prep. Yeah, I only coached the girls one year at Linfield. Oh, only one year? Yeah. Okay. And then um, they smartened up. And I won't ask what, what what made it smarter. I'm sure that you agree that girls are just as uh, entitled to good coaching as Ath- the boys. Well, you know, since I'm the father of two female athletes, yeah. I yeah. mean, they, they I'm just wondering they why take you said it that. serious. Oh, oh just because um, I had applied for the boys' job to begin with. And Giving it to somebody else, and it turns oh. out that that guy wasn't quite qualified. Okay. Um, so as soon as the season ended, I think we the can, guy let me go, and he said, "You want to take over the boys?" Can, can we agree that anybody who doesn't, anytime you you've applied for a job and you, and you haven't got it, whoever they've uh, hired instead of you, it was a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. By- of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me ask you this: um, What was your favorite team? Well, that's, what was your favorite uh, team that I've coached? Yeah. Oh, there's been a number of them. I don't – but well, I did have a team back in Linfield, and only because they were a complete group of knuckleheads. For example, we uh, – it was Halloween, and six of them we were coming up on a state tournament game, and six of them got arrested on Halloween night. So when I asked them what <laughs> happened, they were in Wakefield, uh, which neighbors Linfield, and uh, we're driving around in a van and opening the van door and whipping eggs at people. That and, seems reasonable. Right. So they got <laughs> caught. So I, so I asked them, why Wakefield? And they said, well, coach, nobody would have known who we were. So that's how bright this group was. Um, <laughs> and then we had our first tournament game, and it happened to be on the same exact day as the court case. So I had a number of parents, one who was a police officer in Linfield, who said that they could get the date changed. The court date. Right. Okay. And I told them not, and I asked them not to do that. Okay. And they were pissed, the parents. Yeah. And they were like, why wouldn't you change it? I said, because the kids screwed up and they need to know that they can't just get the date changed. Okay. And we lost one nothing. Did the kids uh, not play in the game? No. They couldn't play in the game? Correct. Because they, they, were, they weren't in school. Right. They were at court. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, they weren't at court in the afternoon. Well, yeah, whatever. They couldn't. They couldn't play in the game, yeah. Wow. Wow. So they learned a valuable lesson. I hope so. This is our after-school special. I hope so. And that's so. your favorite, not the team that won the title. That was a lot of fun. The team before that also where we maybe could have, would have, should have was a great team. Um, a lot of great kids. That There's a kid from that team who became my assistant coach the last couple of years, but he left because now he's in the seminary, Joe Jasinski. So yep. just a little tidbit. Okay. <laughs> that's a little tidbit. <laughs> so – all right, I bet he. I bet he kept in touch with you, didn't he? Oh, he yeah. kept in touch with you, and he's like, "I can, you know, anytime you want to confess your sins, I can, I can do <laughs> no, that." That, that won't the, be happening. But the guy with the rev sick gets, gets us nothing. <laughs> that won't be happening. Let me go to another one. Oh, this is again from Paul. You won't be surprised by this. He's focused on your losses. <laughs> uh, can, <laughs> Paul wants to know: Can you pinpoint? <laughs> Paul's got this whole public school, private school, Catholic school thing. And like he he wants to he, like he wants to know whether or not the prep drives his team to uh, games in a limo instead of a bus, things like that. But uh, this is not about this. He wants to pinpoint. Can you pinpoint the worst loss in your career? And then let us know. Did it affect your coaching strategy going forward? Worst loss in my career was when Tim Murray, the goalie I mentioned earlier, we were playing up at Gloucester in the first round of the tournament. We were way better, but we couldn't score that year. We gave up four goals in 18 games. That year. That's how good Timmy was. Wow. And we were, a little, we were a little more than 500 because we had like eight ties. I remember that year. Yeah. I remember that year. And um, So anyways, we were playing up in Gloucester. The game went into overtime, one-to-one. They did not have the ball past midfield for the almost 30 minutes of overtime. They kicked it down the field, and Timmy came out to clear it, and he was probably 30 yards out of his goal. And he hit it, and there was a Gloucester kid running at him, and it hit him. And ended up in our goal, and we lost. Another so the reason, never to play the ball back to your keeper. Well, it wasn't even being played back to him. He yeah, just, just, I mean, there was. I was literally writing down who was going to take penalty kicks. That's how little time there was left on the clock. He should have put it up in the stands, but instead he tried to clear it up field. I mean, it's you could do it a thousand more times. It's not going to end up in our goal. That's high school sports. And the that's best part of sports. That's, the, that's sports. That's sports. The best part of the story is my center back comes to me afterwards because, you know, you've got 12 kids running after the ball going, towards the other net, and the kid says to me, he goes, Coach, I, I could have got it if I dove and whacked it with my hand. And I said, well, why didn't you do that? He said, well, I would have got a red card. 
<laughs> I said yes, but then they would have had a, taken a penalty kick and, you know, yeah. good chance Tim might have saved it. And- but then he would have missed the next game. Right. So, so I don't know. It's an interesting call. All right, good. Uh, well, here's another one. For, oh, this is from Jim. I got, we got to get a Jim question in here. Uh, Jim wanted to know uh, what got you, what, what uh, player influenced you, what person influenced you, and got you to love soccer. I told him it was me when we were kids. And so we don't have to answer that question. We know it was me because uh, I was playing back then, and uh, Dave could shoot on me, and I would puff up his ego because I was so easy to score on. Uh, actually, the, it would definitely be Bill Foley. Bill Foley. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. High school. Remember, there was no, there wasn't even youth soccer when we were kids, let alone club right. soccer. So the first time you, you might have played in gym in sixth grade. Right. And, and there was a soccer, there was a soccer club at Briscoe. Yeah. But again, I would have been at the trade schools. Okay. Anyway. So yeah, that was the first time I ever played soccer was sophomore year in high school. And Foley was, just, you knew him. He was yeah. just a. Uh, he was what? He was awesome. He was a colorful. Well put. Um, co- he was a colorful coach from Beverly. Former uh, administrator. Well, let's put it this uh, way. He wouldn't last a week coaching today. Because of the fact that he was... Out of his mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, he's, and he said that with love. Is that correct? Well, I, I could... Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I yeah, could good, guy. You, uh, good guy. Good guy. Good guy. Hothead hockey mentality. Brought yeah, he was an soccer. all-American hockey player at uh, Salem State. Yeah, and he was the first varsity coach at Beverly High School. Uh, the year before when I played, there was a club team. And they changed coaches the next year. They brought in Foley for the, uh, the varsity. And uh, they were good. They were good teams. Yeah. Well, I, I tried to use a couple of his tricks when I first started coaching. I was in Linfield, and first year was pretty bad. And we were getting killed in a game. Halftime, I was like, all right, I'm going to go over, and I'm going to get all the skirts from the field hockey players, and you're going to get the skirts <laughs> in the second half. Right? And I'm going on and on and on. And uh, the next day, I pull in the parking lot for practice, and the AD comes up to me and goes, hey, listen, uh, we got to talk. <laughs> <laughs> he says off the record, he goes, I think that's hilarious. <laughs> but you can't do that. <laughs> I'm like, come on, that was my high school coach's best speech. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's actually pretty good. I can see where it would have worked. <laughs> so anyway, I got on to start practice, and I said, okay, guys, put all the balls in the bag because we're only going to run today because I want to know who's the snitch who went home <laughs> and told their parents <laughs> that I said that at halftime, and then the AD gets six calls, so it wasn't just one kid. So we ran for an hour and a half that day. Or they ran. I didn't run. <laughs> it, goes, it goes without saying. That's, that's wicked funny. That was a long time ago. It was a, it was a long time ago, and it's a great line. Uh, Paul, this again, this is from Paul Nidissi again. If it seems like Jim is not holding up, uh, carrying his weight, not completely true. Jim, I think, gave me two questions. I said 10 each. I think Jim gave me two. Well, J- Jim's going with the way he performs every week. Very <laughs> predictably <laughs> lethargic. Yeah. We could, someday we're just going to set up a microphone in front of an empty chair and just say that that's Jim. But anyway, Paul claims that when he was a player, he was a more of a skilled player. Yet the favorite players that he coached, aside from his sons, who were both very good, uh, or, I'm sorry, not both, all four were good soccer players. But aside from the players, uh, from his own kids, the players that he liked the best were the grinders and completely opposite of how Paul played the game. All right, which I suspect that's because these players were also kicking the ball in the right direction and they were probably showing up to game sober. But uh, but he said he was a skilled player, but he always liked the grinders. How are your favorite players style-wise, and how does that compare to your style, which is a relevant term because I've seen you play? I was um, a grinder. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. A grinder in terms of a, a submarine sandwich? Okay, you were a grinder. The players that you like the best, do you find that they fall into a certain category? So the kids who are the grinders who work so hard and then you can reward them and then they succeed, it's, um, you know, from a coaching standpoint, it's a really, really good feeling. But, you you know, you need those skilled guys to put the grinders in a place to succeed. So okay. Yeah, if you have too many of one, you, you, you lose. If you have too many of the other, you lose. Yeah. Um, anyway... Three more questions. I don't even know why I'm asking this. Hockey had a Super 8, but has scrapped it. The idea of putting the the best eight teams into their own category for the tournament. Do you think soccer would benefit from some version of a Super 8, picking the eight best teams and having them go at it and then having everybody else go at it in a different division or Division 1? I don't think it would benefit soccer because soccer, more than any other game, the best team does not always win. 
Okay. Uh, a lot of 